Welcome back to Progressive Talk Podcast with Dave and Josh. Welcome back, Dave. Hey, Josh. How you doing? Yeah, doing all right. It's been uh, quite a week. We've got quite a few things we're going to be covering in this podcast. Some questions about whether or not we think Tulsi is going to be able to make this upcoming debate. One out of the four in the deadlines of 28th, presuming she does not make this debate this in September, I believe she can still make the fourth debate. But the bigger question is, how do we reorient ourselves with her campaign? Well, yeah, it doesn't look too good if she's only has one out of four by the 28th. But I would never give up on Tulsi Gabbard um, uh, for this political cycle or, or any of the future political cycles, that's for sure. Um, she's She has a bright future. She's only 38 years old. Uh, she's super young. So she has a long, bright, healthy future ahead of her. Um, let's hope she makes the third debate and the fourth debate. I foresee my support for her, kind of like you, just it's always going to be there, you know. Some of the concerns some progressive commentators have made about Tulsi Gabbard and her stand on Medicare for All. Do you uh, have any take on the way you have understood her message about Medicare for All more recently? Okay, yeah, it, it's, it seems kind of general. Um, every time I hear Tulsi talk about Medicare for All, it's very generalized, nonspecific talk. And, you know, it, it sounds like she's describing the public option, but she's not saying the public option. That's what I'm getting. And then she does use some language that Bernie use, uh, uses, uh, which is uh, how private health insurance will be there if you want it. And she doesn't explain the capacity or how reduced it will be, or anything like that. Because once again, she speaks in these very broad general strokes. So it sounds like she's like in line with Bernie's Medicare for All, but she never she never clarifies it. It always comes across as very general. And as you know, as most of us know, there are many uh, variants of Medicare for All Medicare for All bills out there. So I would would really like to see her sharpen up her 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 language about which Medicare for all bill she supports. What do you think? Yeah, I do think tendency based on the answers she's given and her past history of being for a public option in the past and mm. how she also at the same time had supported Bernie Sanders' Medicare for all leads me to believe she's more interested in a single payer universal health care system. She also mentioned during her AARP advocate Q&A, she would like to have Medicare for all for those that want it. Now, that's that's the words she actually used. That mm-hmm. even drove me to think more. You know, she's thinking of being open to, as you said, different options. My question to you is, let us for the moment presume that she is for Medicare for all public option. How does that change okay. the way you view her and your support for her, if any? Personally, I see the Medicare for all public option as, you know, the the bottom of my range of support. Like you're just clearing the bar. A candidate is just clearing the bar with uh, a Medicare for all public option. Uh, So Tulsi still qualifies. She's still in the wheelhouse of, of my support, my personal support. Um, I am, however, disappointed if she's not going towards a Sanders type bill, which is the gold standard. Um, you know, I'm kind of disappointed in that, but I think my, I still retain, um, strong support, uh, for Tulsi Gabbard. Uh, It is disappointing, like I said, but I don't think it structurally rearranges my support for her. She's still in my top three. Um, even though if it is, let's say she is just public option, she's not going out of my top three. So it's, she's staying. What about you? I agree with you. I had created a video a couple of weeks ago titled Why Progressives Lose, and one of them is the single-issue voter, uh, where people ah. get attached onto, if it's not if there's no UBI, I'm not voting for anyone else, uh, if it's not Medicare for All, you know, you're a single-issue voter. And I really always have tried to encourage everyone to, to including myself, because even I get trapped into this, is to think of the candidate as a whole rather than just one issue. Think of how are they on on all of the issues and come up with sort of a a way that you can create metric around tabulating their total policies and platform positions and their history, you know, 
and their state it goes uh, really just comprehensively rather than thinking just so specifically about this one it's my support because i think she's so strong in other areas uh that it's very difficult not to support her yeah totally uh, all right so let's move on to the next topic uh regarding uh andrew yang he was at a uh, recent forum gun forum in iowa and did you see that video when one of the mothers in the audience talked about having lost a child to guns and his response to that oh yeah yeah that was that was an amazing moment uh between that grieving mother and andrew yang that was like a very special moment uh, i did a video on it a reaction video on it uh, where i was a weepy mess too just because it was just a, a, a great moment uh yeah, no, I, I watched uh, most of that segment there. Did, did you get a chance to watch it? I did. It was very powerful. And like you, I also created a video uh, highlighting. To me, it indicates he's an empathic individual, got a good balance of high EQ and high IQ, which I feel is really, really missing in politics today and is really yeah. like what's needed, that type of leadership of that, that equilibrium and character. I wanted to ask you, though, I know some... I. I did see some Trump supporters make fun of him and say that it was staged and he was acting. He's trying to get votes. What's your response to that? Oh my God, it's just it's 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 ludicrous. It really it's just absolutely ridiculous. Um, it's it's people on the on the right who who want their guns and they want they don't want anybody um, imposing or a perception of imposing on their rights. Uh, in their guns, and so they lash out uh, when they see Andrew Yang have this empathetic moment, um, you know, and, and he's talking gun issues, talking about gun reform, talking about serious gun legislation reform, you know, and it scares them, uh, and and they lash out, and they, you know, it's the, it's the fake news crowd, oh, there's something I don't like, so you know what, fake news, fake tears, Fake boobs, whatever it is, fake everything. I don't like it. I'm triggered. It's fake. Yay! Mm -hmm. So once again, it's just it's a disingenuous smear uh, by these people who are just upset that they've heard something they don't like, and uh, you know they have to be take disingenuous angles. You know, bring up Alex Jones here. It's just like these people are just ridiculous people who are yeah. just upset. Reactionary. That's it conspiratory uh, FEMA camps <laughs> um, right yeah yeah George Jews Soros will not, yeah. Jews will not replace us you know. <laughs> George Soros will not replace us right exactly along with that some of the other things that were big this week looks like Ber Bernie Sanders was on Joe Rogan and gotten quite a response positive response by going on that show and I think he was the video went viral, like it's at seven or eight million now, and it's like somewhere in the top ten, if not the most viewed Joe Rogan video in history. Did you get a chance to see that particular interview? I did. Certified viral. Uh, that was an awesome one hour. It was a full hour uh, of, of Rogan and Bernie back and forth. These two have never met before. They don't know each other, so it was like a special, a really special thing. Um, and yeah, it, it was just great. Uh, Rogan was great. Bernie was himself as usual. Um, and the response, like the response was just amazing uh, from Rogan's crowd, which I, I mean, I've gotten some blowback from saying this, but Rogan has a predominantly right wing audience. That was my assumption. Uh, but some people are saying, where are you getting that? Or where are you saying Joe is a is, is a right winger? I mean, last I knew Joe was a libertarian. Someone correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, but there was just a lot of people down in the comments who just were glowing. Uh, had, they just had glowing reviews of like, oh, wow. Uh, you know, I've never, I've never listened to Bernie Sanders before. Because you have to think about the sound bites versus a conversation. Bernie Sanders and sound bites, you're going to get the raving, loony, liberal, uh, uh, you know, vibe from him, Okay. <laughs> And then someone's going to criticize them for doing that, for being loud or just yelling and all this other stuff. And then you see Bernie Sanders in a real life conversation. 
a real life conversation about policy, about policy substance, real life issues. You listen to his tone. You can see Joe Rogan react in real time to them. Uh, you know, all these important, really human aspects coming out of this exchange. Uh, because most of the time, most of the stuff Bernie was saying, we've all heard before. Okay, if you're progressive, if you're just politically aware, but mm -hmm. to put it in that context of a Joe Rogan podcast, my God, freaking mm -hmm. awesome! It's just it, it, this is going to do so much good for Bernie and for Rogan's audience. But mm -hmm. yeah, I watched it a couple times. Great podcast. Absolutely. I've always been surprised that he had, hadn't invited Bernie Sanders on previously. I think that Joe Rogan, uh, how do we explain? <laughs> right. I, I think that he's one of these guys, he's sort of like your everyday Joe, excuse the pun. Mm -hmm. But he's open-minded, and as you said, he's, a li he's socially libertarian, he's somewhat fiscally conservative, but he does believe mm -hmm. in some social policies. I think for Correct. Joe, you know, he's sort of your chummy guy who wants to sort of chum up with what's, you know, the sort of the in crowd. You know, that's his world, MTV. Sure. You know, what's popular. That's kind of what he knows, what he sticks to, you know, because he's also sort of a, sort of a capitalist, you know. But I think his heart's sure. generally in the right place. And this is what makes him a little more open-minded and empathetic to hearing other messages. So I think he's a really great kind of platform for uh, Bernie Sanders to have been able to go on and be heard. Because you're right. I think often what happens, as you just pointed out, Dave, is people like you and I and other political junkies or, or getting people that are more, as we like to say, woke to get their news on alternative <laughs> media sites, we tend to forget that we are sort of in our own bubble. And a good swath sure. of uh, Americans either are on the right or in the middle or get their news from Fox or CNN. And then when they hear someone like Bernie Sanders coming on, telling his side of the story, yeah, it's like, whoa, you know, this is totally different from what I've been sold about Bernie, you know. So it's just, right. it's like uh, them hearing for the first time, maybe like how we heard Bernie for the first time. We were sort of in that Clinton bubble world, like, oh, yeah, I'm going to vote for Clinton. And then all of a sudden, Bernie comes along and says, oh, no, you aren't. <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. So... Yeah, impact. Absolutely. Yeah, I can see this this having impact. The word here is impact, uh, and and this Joe Rogan podcast will have an impact, and it's already as you see, it's already certified viral. Uh, but to, it's touching an audience. Yeah, like you said, for the first time, like there's a lot of first timers actually hearing Bernie Sanders, you know, talk in a conversation. They're actually finally hearing him flesh out policy instead of these uh, sound bites that they're used to. And, you know, it, it just has a major impact. Yeah, and I think they come to see he's not as scary as they thought he was. You know, he's a lot more worker-friendly. Uh, he really mm -hmm. is just, as you said, he's very just sound and sensible. He just has solutions that he wants to provide the American people. So Absolutely. Now, having sure. said that, however, over the past week, he had gone from second to third place in the RCP average polling. Now he's around 16.5. Elizabeth Warren is at 18.2%. Biden is somewhere around 31, 32%. So she's narrowing the gap between herself and Joe Biden. And she's now ahead of Sanders. Thoughts about all that activity, those dynamics? Yeah, I, like I'm, per usual, torn on Elizabeth Warren. Um, I, I, I think she might be getting the, 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 you know, what, what are we going to call it? Uh, the, she's being crowned as the next maybe, um, mm -hmm. because oh, I, I honestly can't figure out, I can't figure out where these bumps are, are coming from, where the support is coming from, who's supporting her. Where where do you think this 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 newfound support is coming from? Where's this wave of support from Elizabeth Warren coming from? I'm very curious. Yeah, I'm actually going to make a video on this question at some point, and I'm just going to give you sort of a preview of some of the things that I've been thinking about around this question. I've noticed the polling in general tends to be female and older population heavy, relying on older data, and Elizabeth Warren generally fares better with older women that are say over ah. the age of 50 and you'd be very surprised at how many women resonate with her message right. and there are some women are set on only voting for 
a female candidate because they believe that is due and they are owed that, you know, that even if it means Bernie Sanders might be more progressive or better, Elizabeth Warren's not that far off in their minds. And after 200 and something years of men, then, <laughs> hey, it's our turn. Yeah. And I don't know what percentage of the uh, women make up that group. It's probably the smaller portion. But nonetheless, that still can make a difference of 1, 2, 3 percent perhaps. Okay, so you believe the polling is somewhat skewed then. Um, it could explain these, this, this recent uptick or these past couple months of uptick. Yes, and I also think, unfortunately, the amount of smearing they've been doing on Bernie Sanders is starting to wear on his numbers a little. I think mm -hmm. it really helped her to, to side up with Bernie Sanders during that last debate. She had a good performance. And yeah, she yeah. also was very smart to side up with Bernie because then she came across more of a progressive than she maybe actually is. Sure. And so other progressives were like, hmm, well, maybe, you know, maybe I'll think I'll consider her. So as far as her being coronated by the Democratic Party, that's a difficult one. Other people argue it's not that she's coordinated, but rather it's an attempt to split her and Bernie's vote so that Biden can have a clean walkthrough, you know, sort of like parting the Red Sea and Moses comes I through. I get it. Uh, so yep. it's hard to say. Okay. It's hard to say. But let me ask you, how much you know about her past, her history, and how would you qualify her? Uh, would, you be, would you consider that she is a progressive, and to what degree or extent? He, uh, mild. If, if I, she's a mild, I know that's not like a, an actual term, a uh, political term, but I would say she's mildly uh, progressive. Um, she's a, you know, she, she stated she's a capitalist. Uh, so, you know, her progressivism can only go so far if she's one, a capitalist. Uh, so I just don't see, you know, like I keep saying, she has one foot in the centrist pool, one f foot in the progressive pool, and she wants to swim in both. You know, it's, it's like, she doesn't want to commit to progressivism. She wants to lean into it. She wants to flirt with it. She wants to, you know, rub up against it. But, you know, she, she's not committed to it like Bernie Sanders is. So it's kind of like uh, Warren frustrates me. She just frustrates me. And I, I feel like I feel this distrust with her because mm -hmm. of 2016. And, you know, she's she's. And listen, she was a Republican at one time, but that's fine. People move, people evolve. I was conservative at one time. I was libertarian at one time. You know, you find your way along life and you change and you evolve. And, and, and so I don't have, I don't see a problem there. I, I have a problem with her raising up Hillary Clinton's hand in 2016 uh, when she could have supported Bernie Sanders. Um, that's, I have more of a problem with that than anything with her. And that leads to distrust. There was someone, I, I think it might have been Kyle, who said Clinton had offered her choices for VP pick, and this okay. is why Elizabeth Warren endorsed Clinton, but Clinton never really ultimately was going to have her uh, be the pick anyway. So it was sort of like a strategic move on Clinton's behalf. Uh, oh, yeah. Mac and Elizabeth million. fell into the trap. You know, that's, I don't know if that's an apologetic sort of telling of what actually happened. Uh, nobody was there. Nobody really knows. But uh, right. I do recall s someone that's fairly respected in the progressive talk community was mentioning that her history, at least more recently, she's very strong with consumer protections. And she was part of the Glass-Steagall movement. Uh, she is pushing for a single-payer system, maybe not Bernie Sanders Medicare for All. And she is pushing for, you know, wealth tax, some degree of educational loans being paid off. So as you said, she's sort of like your, your salt and pepper progressive. Yeah, but I, I think she might have been like during the debates, like like you said, like she she partnered up with Sanders and it was her and Sanders versus basically versus that entire stage. And, you know, maybe that helped Elizabeth Warren shore up where she needs to go because it, it's kind of instinct. It was kind of instinctual. It seemed instinctual for her to do that. Like, oh, whoa, I, you know, you know, I do have progressive leanings. You know, I wait, 
I am on Bernie's side. Yeah, it is me and him up here versus everyone else, pretty much. So I think there was a realization. There could have been a realization there in real time happening. Her because, like I said, she she's all over the place. She has these Medicare for all pathway options. She talks about the fifty five and over bill or the fifty five and under. I forget. Uh, she 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 talks all of these paths, and it's just so. It's just like commit to something, Elizabeth. Please just commit to something. Uh, so, but when she was up on that stage, you can see it really clicked. Uh, so I, I just hope that gave her some, you know, some insight to like, yes, this is who I am. Yes, I am a progressive. Like that's the best case scenario, but she did shine up there. I have to say that more I watch her, the more I've been watching her, the more I'm coming to learn about who she is. There's two words that come to mind. The first one is she's a strategist and mm -hmm. I don't necessarily think that everything she did on the stage was completely unauthentic. I do think to some extent, mm -hmm. like you said, she's a, so I, like I was saying, she's a salt and pepper progressive, you know, just pepper around, season a little bit the policies with some progressive, yep. progressivism. So, and she mm -hmm. does have a track record of some progressive policies, so we can't rob her of that. For the past you know, 10, mm -hmm. 15 years, she's led the charge for certain progressive policies like Glass-Steagall and uh, consumer protections and things of that nature, you know, gay rights and abortion rights and going after big business and banks. So there's, it isn't as though, you know, she just made it up like Clinton on the, on the trail or Biden saying he's a progressive. She actually has some degree of a track record. So, so there is some authenticity there. However, at the same time, it doesn't mean that she won't sort of peak, you know, maybe she'll do 99 out of 100 on her test where she's like totally answering it for herself, but then she'll peek over and look at one, you know, kind of like that. Mm -hmm. She's a strategist, so she's an opportunist. So I, I don't think she's completely not sellable, you know, and you know this because she's also willing to take super PAC money. But her end, yes. her end goal is strategic, and that's what's really in question. What is her strategy really? What is her end goal? Is it progressive or is it centrist? Is she just throwing the wool over her eyes, you know, in the long term? Yeah. Um, the second word that comes to mind is scrappiness. You know, she has this mm -hmm. intense capacity to cut through things uh, invariably. Like she never really lost anything. And she started out with very humble beginnings. She was poor and she worked her way up. You know, I think her father mm -hmm. was a janitor or something. She came from a very humble upbringing and she worked her way through. She went to the University of Houston, then she from there, she went to intermediate school and then eventually made to Harvard. And then she got into politics and, and, you know, she just climbed up the staircase. And I think that people that know that about her, that have been following her, really respect her for that reason. I think that for a lot of Bernie supporters, she left a bad taste in our mouths, you know, like what happened uh, back in 2016. And the fact that she's willing to take super PAC money, and you know, that kind of sort of gives us the side glance, like what's what's going on over here, lady? You know, um, well, yeah. But yeah, I think going back to what you said, the debates. I think it was a little bit of what you said. It was natural, but at the same time, I think it was also a little bit strategic. I wouldn't put it past her. Yeah, yeah. There was a yeah a couple things that were strategic from that. One, her tone. I noticed her tone. Uh, during that, when she partnered up with Bernie, was more mild. She was definitely, like you said, she's kind of scrappy. She she definitely toned down the scrappiness uh, because she knew Bernie was going to be the loud one, could be the aggressor, be the angry one up there. And I know she wanted to contrast herself uh, there. So I thought that was kind of like strategic. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and just her, play, like you're saying, yeah, it, 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 like her just partnering, partnering up with Bernie you know, and gartering herself as a progressive uh, up there, that is strategic, too. Like, that is her playing politics. Like, oh, I, Bernie's so popular. Well, I can partner up with him. And, you know, I'm Bernie Sanders right now in this yeah. moment. Hey, it's, you know, it's like me or him. It's like, oh, look, look, you got one. You got one male, one's female. But we're pretty much the same thing, you yeah. know. Right, right. Exactly. Exactly. You hit it. And, so. and uh, she's also... A lot smarter than people give her credit. You know, she's very street smart. You know, she she's paying attention even when you think she isn't, and she's sizing things <laughs> up. Yeah. The thing also is, I think people same thing that did with Donald Trump, they're doing with her, and this is they're underestimating her. Um, mm -hmm. I think that because she's sort of like 
so light she comes across so lightweight you know uh she's she's small frame you know her voice is kind of high and squeaky and and so people just sort of like push her aside you know and mm -hmm. that actually may be playing to her favor because they're just sort of not taking her seriously and she's like well <laughs> you know get ready here because here i come uh, yeah exactly war in support versus primary versus uh like um the election let's say do we support her in the primary? Like, like, like I've been building this coalition with you, basically. It's been basically both of us here. Uh, you know, it was, uh, who was it? Gravel, Williamson, Yang, Sanders, and Gabbard, minus Mike Gravel now. Uh, you know, and I was thinking, like, oh, do we add Elizabeth Warren? You know, would, would she be a nice addendum uh, to a primary candidate we should support? What are your thoughts about that? Hmm. I've already decided that she's probably somewhere in number five or six or seven, somewhere in that range. Like she's what I would consider to be B category. Uh, so okay. Okay. right now it doesn't look likely that Williamson is going to be able to make it. So that means that obviously she falls out of there. Gravel's already fallen out. She might be able to get in. Williamson might be able to get in. She still needs around 10,000 donors. So if you haven't donated, make sure you do so. She also needs four of the national polls and she doesn't have any at this point. Okay. So but that leads us then down to Yang, Gabbard, and Bernie. Presuming that they're not able to make it either, then yeah, she's going to be in my lineup of just kind of go down the checklist, next on the list, whoever's next on the list, so forth and so on. If Yang doesn't make it, so forth and so on. Tulsi doesn't make it, so forth and so on. Williamson doesn't make it, so forth and so on. Right now, I'm, I'm open to the top tier, which is the four that we've been supporting, along with Gravel, but of course mm -hmm. he's out of there. And then the second tier right. comes along only if the other ones don't make it. But anything beyond or below the what I call B tier, which I think are people like Castro, uh, Warren, if Bill de Blasio were to be able to make it, Inslee, these are the ones yeah. that I put in the B category. I'm willing to consider voting for them. Uh, but if we start getting into the C category, then... I mean, I might, you know, if it looks so evident, Biden is definitely going to get in there for the nomination. Then, you know, I, 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 pro I may just have to either consider not taking part in the primaries, only doing like downvoting all Democrats, like senator and things like that, or mm. having to hold my nose. I don't really know at this point. What are your thoughts? Like, kind of, how would you strategize it? Yeah, no, yeah, you, pretty much kind of what you're doing there, like have my cluster of primary candidates, you know, our top tier, A tier, B tier, and C tier. And uh, yeah, just check them off as they go. You know, if Mary has the next one to drop out, she, she's off the list. And we have Bernie, uh, Yang, and Gabbard. And, you know, if Yang falls off there, we got Gabbard and Sanders. And then it gets, the fat gets trimmed. It's the primary. It's going to happen one way or the other. There can only be one. So, yeah, I see Elizabeth Warren. I think I can hold off on supporting Elizabeth Warren and hold her in the B column where she is a second tier candidate. So I can I can see myself just holding off of putting her into my A cluster, which I've been, you know, flirting with here. But I will keep her in in the B tier for now. Um like I'm just, a, if she got the primary Maybe she's a B plus then for you. She's she's definitely B. She yeah she she's definitely leaning. She's a B leaning into the A column, like okay. uh, at the bottom of the A column uh, for me. Uh, just just because, like you said, she does have progressive chops uh, policies. She's on record for supporting them, and that still means something. But we know, uh, you know, she wavers a lot. She's very she's very you know wishy washy very centrist at times and that knocks her down that just keeps her low on the list but definitely be leaning on an a i will vote for her. if she becomes the if she becomes the nominee it's it's a slam dunk i'm gonna vote for her. there's just no doubt about it in the general but okay. yeah what about the general for you let's say elizabeth warren gets the general are you voting for her or are you considering third party yeah i really always hate to commit myself to a candidate uh, unless they're in yeah. the A tier because I think one of the problems with doing that is it gives uh, you know mainstream media this position to say well they're going to vote for us anyway so what's the point of covering progressive candidates you know I feel like we need to make them shake 
And so they may not go on and listen to progressive channels all the time, but they might have some people checking them out, you know, listening in on us even. And say, hey, they're going to vote for Elizabeth anyway, so why cover Bernie? So for me, it's oh. more like I just don't want to go there until That's I get fine. to a place where I don't have a choice between, you know, Warren versus Trump. And then I get to see sort of like, okay, what do you have to offer me, you know? Uh, and how, you know, like well, maybe, you know, I'll look at Trump and I'll look at Warren and I'll say, okay, which of these I really think is best for this nation at this point in this juncture. I just don't want us to, in, in my opinion, it's better not to jump the gun. I feel like Warren has a high chance of losing to Donald Trump. Yeah. Much more yeah. so than if it were the top tier candidates. I think the strongest ones are definitely Bernie, Tulsi, and Yang. Those are the ones I so, feel so confident that it has the best chance of beating Donald Trump. And I think that's Absolutely. what we need to totally continue to sell. And I think that's what's making the difference in, in the polling is that we're not selling enough that these three candidates can beat Donald Trump, hands down. I don't know. What do you yep. think? Do you differ from what I'm saying or do you have a different take on it? Yeah, no, no. I mean, that's definitely the smarter take. Uh, I, always, I always run scenarios through my head that are way in the future that I probably don't have to really even – address but uh, no, we, I, yeah we, i totally feel it like it's funny because we're <laughs> kind of like switching roles here i remember the first few progressive talks that we did i would be the one speculating way ahead you know and now you're, <laughs> do, now you're doing that so we just kind of keep each other together you know equal, have a little bit of um tempered te helping to temper temper each other uh, like a counterweight. Try to, right counterweight keep each other from thinking too far ahead and getting too excited but, uh, yeah, I do think it's better to focus on just allowing things to unfold and taking us down that pathway and trusting that pathway, you know. Yeah, so. that's smart. I am thinking probably by the time November, December comes around, it'll be much, much clearer to all of us where everybody stands and kind of where we need to go, you know. Yeah, due time. Uh, let's see. I think we covered everything. Let's take a look here. We got Dave. What do you got? What about the billionaires who are supporting uh, Democrats? Did you see that Forbes article? Yeah, I didn't. I just out of the corner of my eye, I saw something about it. Uh, what do you know about it, and what are your thoughts around it? Uh, let's see here. So Forbes ran a magazine, uh, ran a article um, entitled "Here Are the Democratic Presidential Candidates with the Most Donations from Billionaires." So they spread out the list. I'll, I'll just stick to the top five. If you want to work down from there, we'll go there. But Pete Buttigieg is at number one, 23 billionaires. Cory Booker's number two, 18 billionaires. Kamala Harris, 17 billionaires. Michael Bennett, 15 billionaires. And Joe Biden, 13 billionaires. Um, let's just start in the womb. Um, I think we do, like, have we've been garnering some new uh some new listeners and, you know, people are new to politics. Why is it a red flag for a candidate to have so many billionaires uh, backing them? In your opinion, what, for the new listeners, for the people who have just got into politics, uh, you know, why is it a concern for these, these billionaires to be throwing all their weight behind these candidates? Hmm. I do think we get concerned about, money interest and the influence in politics of the corporate state and that outweighing the voice of the American people because money buys power. It becomes important to bring back some degree of equal equilibrium about how much voice do we have and how much of that is being drowned out by big money interest like pharmaceutical companies, oil industries, military industrial complex, the corporate media state. Are they the ones that are dictating for America or are the American people really being able to have a voice at the table? I think that's what it comes down to. Money buys power, and they have a lot more money than we do. Fully agree. Yeah, and if you want to look at the bottom of the list, uh, the bottom of the list is very interesting. Uh, Tulsi Gabbard, Andrew Yang, and Marianne Williamson have one billionaire between them. And Bernie Sanders, Julian Castro, Bill de Blasio all have zero billionaires. So... We like the people at the – notice how we naturally, as progressives, uh, how we like the people who are at the bottom of this list. Gabbard, yeah. Yang, William, and Bernie. So it's just – this is – progressives, like, 
like me and you care about money and politics. We care about the corruption element of big money, and we know it impacts. Uh, we know it impacts our lives when politicians get this money. We know that it, it, in some capacity or somewhere down the line, there's just so much liability for corruption to happen to put the corporations before the will of the people who they're elected to represent. So this is why we're against big money in politics. This is why we support Tulsi Gabbard, Andrew Yang, Marianne Williamson, uh, Mike Ravel, and, and Bernie Sanders, because they're just they're grassroots. They take no PAC money, no billionaire money. And it's a safer bet to to bet on these candidates who are away from corruption or potential corruption. Absolutely. So essentially, money can buy influence and power, and these politicians can be influenced by the NRA, the pharmaceutical industry. They'll be more inclined to do so because you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. And it's what's running their campaigns. Without that money, many of them, they, they're not able to run their campaigns. And so they know that, and so they feel pressured to go ahead and cave in to these billionaires' uh, demands. Interesting, as you pointed out, Dave, it's almost like we have a progressive radar, you know. <laughs> we can just sort of pick up, okay, you're a progressive, you're not a progressive. Uh, and even without looking at their records, really, in many ways, it's, it's really funny. Even like we're, we're very like apprehensive by Elizabeth Warren, you know, we can kind of see just by her lingo some of the choices that she makes that makes her question rather not she how authentic of a progressive progressive she really is but yeah interesting article very interesting findings yeah so i think that pretty much wraps it up yeah it sounds good for now all right awesome all right this has been progressive talk podcast episode number 16 thanks for listening always feel free to let dave and i know if there's any topics you'd like us to discuss in future progressive talk podcasts and don't forget if you haven't done so already Go over to Dave's channel and subscribe and help grow his voice. That is Progressive Resistance Media. Dave, any last words here today before we we say bye? Just stay progressive, my friend. Absolutely. All right. Good talking with you and talk to you next week. All right. Take care.